Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the kind introduction. And let me share my screen so we can start with the talk right on time. And hopefully you can see the talk. Everything looks good, perfect. So yes, again, thank you for the kind introduction. And of course, also I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me. This is really a fantastic opportunity. I have enjo enjoyed very much this webinar series. And uh, yes, today I'm going to tell you about our work at Cardiff University. We have developed a technique which I have called for remixing interferometry to uh, detect an image, single small gold nanoparticles inside cells, background free. So this is really very much the, the, the main aim of my talk. And I would like to start with a little bit of, an, of a motivation. I guess I don't have to convince you that optical microscopy is really very important for bioimaging. And it's really a powerful way to image living cells with a very good spatiotemporal resolution. And a workhorse for optical microscopy is fluorescence microscopy. However, I think it's also fair to say that uh, with fluorescence fluorescence microscopy, there are some drawbacks, and particularly fluorophore, organic fluorophores are prone to photobleaching and uh, associated phototoxicity. So there are issues uh, in terms of performing live cell imaging experiments. There are issues in terms of total observation times, which may be limited by photobleaching, and of course, also quantitative analysis due to this uh, issue. So I think there is a lot of interest in trying to develop uh, optical microscopy techniques that do not rely on fluorophore labels. So the uh, techniques that use non-fluorescent uh, methods uh, and therefore ideally uh, they are photostable and quantitative. So to that end, we have been very interested in uh, gold nanoparticles because gold nanoparticles have a very good absorption and scattering at the so-called localized surface plasmon resonance. And this sort of optical response is very photostable. Gold nanoparticles are also biocompatible. And it is also quite important to uh, mention that this type of optical response is really governed by the so-called optical extinction cross-section and the incident intensity. So we don't have issues such as a finite excited state lifetime of fluorophores. However, when we try to image gold nanoparticles inside cells, for example, using dark field microscopy, we also rather uh, easily realize that there is a lot of scattering from a cell. So there is a lot of background. It's really not easy to uh, distinguish single small gold nanoparticles inside highly scattering and potentially autofluorescing cellular environment. So how do we go about that? What, what, what can we do to solve this problem? And this is what we, uh, what we have been working on. So in my lab, we have been working on a technique that um, let's say goes under the general umbrella of four wave mixing where effectively we use short optical pulses in practice, in our case, really in a pump probe uh, type of sequence. Uh, these pulses are all in resonance with the localized surface plasma resonance of a gold nanoparticle. So we have a fully wavelength degenerate scheme. And in practice, what happens is that we have a short pulse that acts as a pump is absorbed at the localized surface plasma resonance by a gold nanoparticle. And effectively on a very short time scale, it creates a hot electron gas. And this hot electron gas is going to change the nanoparticle dielectric function and therefore the nanoparticle ability to transmit and scatter light. And this is probed by a subsequent probe pulse and manifest as this sort of signal. And now uh, we have been doing quite some work and this is actually a fairly old paper. And I would say this is actually quite well established in the literature, what happens if we change the delay time between the pump and probe pulses? So what sort of ultra fast dynamic we are seeing? And as I say, this is fairly well understood, but just very briefly, 
basically the pump initially uh, creates or transfers energy onto the nanoparticle in the form of a localized surface plasmon, which then very rapidly becomes a hot electron gas on a 100 femtosecond time scale. And this is this sort of rise behavior that we see. And then we have a thermalization on the few picosecond time scale uh, of the hot electron gas with the lattice and then a thermalization with the environment. And, and essentially we look at this pump induced change in the transmitted or scattered light of the probe, which is our four-way mixing. As I say, there are these thermalization dynamics. We uh, shown back then that we can explain very well this behavior. What was particularly interesting in this work that we did was that we developed an interferometric four-way mixing technique. So we were sensitive to amplitude and phase of the detected four-way mixing field. And in that way, we could essentially measure the complex dielectric function in its real and in an imaginary part and the change, the pump induced change in the complex dielectric function. But effectively, if we now want to think of uh, about an imaging modality with all of this, so let's say we put the delay time between pump and probe at an optimum position after a few hundred femtoseconds where we have the maximum change. And now we think about making an image by raster scanning a beam or a sample. If we think of this as an imaging modality, now we can start to appreciate the benefits and the advantages. So we have a, a coherent signal that can be detected interferometrically, and therefore we are free from incoherent, for example, autofluorescence background. We have a nonlinear signal, so we can detect this response uh, in a way that is separated from the linear scattering of pump and probe beams. So we are free from linear scattering background. It is a multi-photon microscopy modality similar to two-photon fluorescence. And so we have a very good three-dimensional uh, spatial resolution and optical sectioning capabilities. We are resonant to the specific absorption of the gold nanoparticle. And using this delay between pump and probe, we can essentially uh, let's say highlight the nonlinearity that comes from this hot electron gas after a few hundred femtoseconds separated from instantaneous or long lived other nonlinearities. So um, what we have been doing over the years is, has been to develop a, a, a more advanced microscope, what we call our second generation setup, which is actually based in the School of Bioscience where I am and is used for biological applications. And very quickly, I know it looks a bit complicated, but I will try to highlight the main, let's say the main points of this microscope. It works with 100 femtosecond pulses at in this particular case, 550 nanometers, so in resonance with the localized surface plasmon of a spherical gold particle at 80 megahertz. And what we do, uh, as I mentioned, we do a, a, an interferometric detection. And how we do that, we use a, a heterodyne scheme. Uh, so effectively, all our uh, beams are at the same wavelength, so we need to find a way in which we can distinguish the pump from the probe from the four-way mixing. And so we do this by uh, shifting by a radio frequency amount the optical frequency of the probe beam using an acousto-optic modulator. We then use also an acousto-optic mod modulator in the pump beam to generate uh, an amplitude modulation. In this geometry, we have an epi detection, so we detect for mixing in reflection, and then we interfere with an external reference, the four-way mixing with this beam, and this reference field is not radio frequency shifted. So through this interference, now we have a number of bit frequencies at appropriate radio frequencies with which we can distinguish the probe itself, so the reflected probe, from the uh, sideband amplitude modulated sideband that correspond to the four way mixing. So effectively, we have very well defined radio frequencies that we can detect with a locking amplifier and simultaneously measure the, ref the reflectometry from the sample as well as the four way mixing image. We also have developed a polarization resolved scheme that I don't have the time to explain in detail, and more details can be found in this paper, but very briefly, we use circularly polarized light. 
Um, and essentially, we are able to detect the co and cross circularly polarized component of the four way mixing relatively to the input circularly polarized probe. And we can do this again simultaneously. And I will show you in, in a following slide why this is useful and, and why this is important. But first of all, let me uh, convince you that in this way now we are really very background free. And in this case, we have HeLa cells that were prepared such that they, there were 40 nanometer diameter gold nanoparticles inside. Uh, the cells in this case were fixed. And this is a DIC, so a differential interference contrast, wide field image in plane. And clearly we see lots of structure, but it's very hard to tell where the gold nanoparticles are. Uh, this is also a reflectometry on this uh, framed, uh, uh, let's say, uh, region of interest. And again, it's very hard to tell where gold nanoparticles are. But then when we do for remixing, we clearly see individual gold nanoparticles particles that are well resolved in X, Y, and Z with an extremely good contrast. So we now really have this possibility to uh, detect individual gold nanoparticles inside a highly scattering and fluorescing backgrounds. So what do we do with this technique? Now, an application example, which we did a few years ago, was to look at this sort of uh, combinations where we have a protein of interest, in this case, transferrin, uh, labeled with a fluorophore, but also labeled with a gold nanoparticle. And why we were looking at this con construct? Because this type of constructs are very much utilized in correlative light electron microscopy for bioimaging. So people are interested in looking at certain specific molecule. These molecules are labeled with the fluorophore so that they can do fluorescence microscopy, but then they are also labeled with a gold nanoparticle, which is electron dense and therefore very clearly visible in an electron microscope. And they trust that these two probes are essentially reporting the same molecule. And we effectively wanted to check that because now we have a way to look at gold nanoparticles by light microscopy because it's a gold nanoparticle and not relying on a fluorophore. So we did correlative for remixing confocal fluorescence. And actually, we found that in that particular case, but also in a number of other cases, there is a very poor co-localization between the fluorophore and the gold nanoparticle, which is quite an interesting message for people's people who are using this sort of construct for correlative light electron microscopy, they really have to be careful because these constructs often lose their integrity and actually the two probe do not co-localize. Another example of application that we have been developing in this case very recently with biologist colleagues here in the School of Bioscience has been to look at this particular species, which is actually the common wood louse. This is an isopod that ingests metal nanoparticle from the soil. So it is quite interesting also from a point of view of ecotoxicology, nanotoxicology. And these biologist colleagues were very interested in finding out where gold nanoparticles ingested by this. Uh, by this isopod are going to be sequestered where they are located inside the digestive tract, which is the hepatopancreas, and whether they do specifically stay in certain cell types. And so we did this study with them. And again, this was quite interesting because this kind of organ is, is actually very big and very heterogeneous and very scattering. And we were able to look at specific parts and again show that gold nanoparticles were present and specifically accumulated in, in certain cell types. And so this was quite interesting from them from a biology point of view, and we hope to do more work work going forward. Now I would like to briefly talk about the polarization resolved concept and what is the idea behind and why we thought this would be interesting. So one idea that we had was to track single small gold nanoparticles without the need of making an image. So tracking without scanning by simply detecting in a, in a polarization resolved way, the amplitude and phase of the field and being able to tell from this information where the particle is in position and direction without having to make a scan and therefore potentially very rapidly. And so we started with this idea that if we look at the field pattern, this is a calculation of the light field distribution in the focal plane of a high numerical apartheid objective using circularly polarized light, there is 
a component, a cross-circularly polarized component that has this donut shape. So effectively is an optical vortex. And now if we think of having a point like probe in a certain position away from the focus center, the amplitude and the phase of this cross-polarized component is going to tell us where this point like probe is in position and direction. So we thought we could exploit that for tracking without scanning. We went on and did a full calculation of the forward mixing response that we will expect and, uh, and calculated the ratio between the cross and copolarized component, which is a user for, user for ratio metric quantity. And again, how this could be used to locate the particle in plane, in position and direction. And also realize that if we look at the phase of the reflected forward mixing wave, this phase also encodes an information about the location of the nano particle in Z. So in principle, we have an X, Y, Z, let's say positioning without scanning that we could exploit for very fast tracking. So the first thing we did was to then try and check experimentally whether this idea was working at all. And so in first place, what we did, we looked at gold nanoparticle attached onto a glass surface and try to see whether we could reproduce this optical vortex pattern. And to our surprise, we looked at many, many different nanoparticles and we could never observe this optical vortex pattern. The closest to this optical vortex pattern that we could observe was something like this, something where we had two nodes uh, near the center. And so different particles were given different uh, responses. And we realized that if we take into account that particles are never perfectly spherical and we include a tiny asymmetry in the particle shape, really with an ellipsoid model, which really in this case had an extremely small difference in the length of the semi-axis, we were able to reproduce our experimental findings. So effectively, we really realized that our cross-polarized four-way mixing is a very sensitive reporter of the nanoparticle shape. So this was interesting on the one hand, it means that we had to rethink about our tracking strategy, but also it meant that we have a very sensitive reporter of the nanoparticle shape, which was a new information. So uh, of course we can also say, well, if we do an image, we can locate this, the, the nanoparticle position via a centroid point spread function localization argument, which is what a lot of people do in, in single molecule localization. And obviously we can do the same. And just to show that in principle, we can have a very good localization precision in our uh, type of experiments. We still have the phase of the reflected wave that we can also use, that is potentially a very sensitive readout of the position of the nonparticle. Uh, about, about two minutes left, sorry. Yes, about two great. Minutes left. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick. So, so yes, so basically, um, in principle, we have this opportunity. And so therefore, maybe in the interest of time, I will skip the, this. That was just an example where we use this modality. And to conclude, really, the last point I want to make is that, of course, we can also do correlative light electron microscopy. Now we have a gold nanoparticle that we can see under our light microscope, and of course can be seen in an electron microscope. And now this is the very same probe. So ideally we have really the best correlation accuracy that one could imagine. And so we did an experiment in collaboration with Bristol where they have excellent electron microscopy capabilities. They prepared cells which were prepared with high pressure freezing, freeze substitution, the raising embedding. They contained gold nanoparticles and eventually we got a copper slit with slices of these raising embedded cells. And then we look at them under our optical microscope. Initially, we did a transmission overview, identify the region of interest. And on this region of interest, it started with our forward mixing. This is a reflectometry, which again, doesn't tell us much. And then with forward mixing, we start to see individual gold nanoparticles. And when we send back the, uh, the slides to Bristol, they did an electron microscopy and we could find exactly the, the same pattern of nanoparticles in the electron microscope with an extremely good correlation accuracy. In fact, we also quantified these correlation accuracies by checking how the position coordinate that we measured in forward mixing relate to the position coordinates in the electron microscope and define this sort of matrix to, to essentially quantify this accuracy, which we found to be around 50 nanometer in this reasonably large field of view 
And in principle, this is limited by systematics because we know that the uh, localization precision can be better than that. We did it also with smaller nanoparticles, five nanometer radius here, same result. And this really brings me to the conclusion. So I hope I have um, maybe uh, generated some curiosity around our photo mixing imaging modality. I hope I've convinced you that this is a in, really interesting and potentially very powerful technique to uh, locate, to find the position of gold nanoparticles, individual small gold nanoparticles inside cells. We have developed correlative workflows. We are sensitive to shape and we have potentially uh, biological applications that we are uh, going to, to explore further. And as an outlook, we certainly want to work more on the tracking idea, but in my lab, we are also developing and, and working on coherent Raman scattering. So a kind of a overarching goal for me will be to detect the local field enhanced coherent Raman scattering signal in the vicinity of a gold nanoparticle to achieve chemical sensing at the nanoscale, potentially inside a cell. So with that, I would like to acknowledge the collaborators and colleagues, postdocs and PhDs, funding bodies, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, uh, that now we are open for questions. So just speak up or, or uh, write something in the chat and uh, we'll try to find it. Uh, maybe you can start with a question myself. So uh, what, what the results you, you present uh, remind me very much of, you know, with golden particles of these uh, polarization analysis that we did by you know a variety of uh, gold nanoparticles uh, and of course we see that they are really not perfect at all they have a lot of uh, you know anisotropies and 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 sometimes even uh, you know they are chiral uh, in in our case you know we did that with the photothermal in a way it's it's also a four wave mixing signal yes. right because we are looking at an uh, thermal origin so how would you so first of all my part, first part of my question is what delay do you choose between pump and, and probe and and secondly you know what um is there a gain in in signal by looking at for example uh, electronic uh, response yes. instead of uh, thermal response thermal. and yes yep. Yeah, so we work at, in the imaging, we work at 500 picosecond. And yes, with gold nanoparticle using our, our technique, essentially there is quite a significant gain. We are fully resonant at the localized surface plasma. So essentially we have this kind of effect as compared to the long-lived phototermal effect, which will be kind of the long-lived nonlinearity that you will have left. And actually, in our case, is almost negligible. So with the power that we work, which of course are very, very small, we work with tens of microwatts power. So we, we work with extremely low power to try and actually minimize uh, a long-lived, uh, let's say, photo, uh, th temperature change. Uh, we have a, 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 a significant transient hot electron effect and essentially almost no long-lived photothermal effect. So for us, it's actually quite beneficial. So the delay is 500? 500, 500, yeah, femtoseconds. Femtose 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 so we kind of yes, stick here, yeah, yeah. So you still have a very strong uh, hot electron uh, contribution. Exactly. So we, system, yes. we stay at the, at, the, at the highest point here. So five, yeah, 500 femtoseconds with oh, our nice. pulsar. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are, yeah. there, are there more questions? I have a question. Yes, please uh, go ahead, Frank. Uh, th thank you very much for the nice talk. I mean, um, I, I was wondering how fast, because you can track now X, Y, and Z uh, and orientation, how fast you could uh, do that overall? I mean, on which time scales? Yes, uh, so the, the, the typical acquisition times per, per point that we use when, when we did some of this tracking experiment was between 0.2 millisecond to one millisecond, so mm -hmm. sub sub millisecond. Mm -hmm. Of course, again, it depends on the nanoparticle and uh, how much signal you have. I mean, the photo mixing field scales with the nanoparticle volume, yeah. so it's directly proportional to the nanoparticle volume as a field, because we are sensitive to the field. So yeah, that's so, at the sort of time scale that we are also aiming at when tracking sub millisecond. Okay. So the uh, the particle, if I may ask, the, the particle where you detected essentially the orientation was also uh, this 19 nanometer particle size or what size was so that? So for the tra tracking of orientation, uh, I think we worked with uh, a slightly bigger particle there. 
uh, I believe, okay, I haven't really shown this experiment, but I believe, uh, I believe this uh, results refer to particles that were having a diameter of 50, 5, 0 nanometer. Okay. So they okay. were a little bit bigger, but we know we can detect down to 10 nanometer diameter, still at reasonably low power. Again, of course, signal to noise ratio <laughs> is worse. And, yeah. and we haven't tried a tracking with this smaller particle, but essentially, what I would like to do is to, to find a way where I can still benefit from this donut story. Yeah. And, and we have ideas around that, but also at the same time, use the, the let's say, rotation uh, option that the cross-polarized information is giving us. So try to, to find a way where I can use the best of both, but we are still working on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any more question? I don't see anyone in the chat. I make maybe I, I can uh, ask another one. I was wondering um, when you showed this organism uh, um, study of uh, so the um, organism ingest the nanoparticles, and then you image. I think you image on the organ, right? Not the whole the whole uh, yes. animal. <laughs> uh, but but yes. I was wondering, you know, how. How much, of course, this this structure has uh, in homogeneity in the text or a fraction. This will affect the the quality of the focus, right? Yes. So how how serious is that? I mean, how how much are you losing signal and signal to noise ratio yes. by uh, having this uh, more difficult uh, yes. refractive environment? To, yeah, to no, that, that, that's an excellent point. So you know, and by the way, we don't do any, let's say, sophisticated aberration correction or anything of that sort. So we could go, so, so we did look at the, at the organ, as you said, which is this tubule, which is actually really multicellular. And, and we did go through. Paula, your sound, well, your sound is just uh, mute. I don't know something. We lost your, your voice. At least I lost it. No, I cannot, I cannot hear you. No, I... uh, Subasis, are you hearing? No, we, we cannot hear yeah. also. Yeah. Well, yes, okay, it's not only me. I mean, um, microphone is, seems to be enabled. It's not muted, but uh, uh, I hope I did not mute uh, the myself. This, uh, somebody's swallowing the sound. Mm -hmm. Do we see a picture? I mean, yeah, Paula also disappeared now from my. On Let my screen. If I can ah, ah. And now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe if I can. Maybe I can change the. But I, I can hear you perfectly now. So it's fine. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why this is not working. Probably the system switch to the computer's yeah. microphone and uh, this is working again. You can hear me now. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you very well. I, at least I can hear you. I switched. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to be quick because I, I am uh, in the interest of time. But yes, we, we, we can go through several hundred microns into these uh, tubules. So we went through at, at least two, three hundred microns inside in Z. Um, and, and, and so, yes, but of course, eventually we do have issues. And we, we were not using any aberration correction, by the way. But a few hundred microns into a reasonably highly scattering system, it was possible. All right. Okay. And you can still see very small nanoparticles, uh, yes. the same size. Nice. Yes. 